thanks to the MSP project for uh, the kind of invitation. I think it's great to be here with uh, uh, so, so, so many uh, of you who have uh, such a rich experience of fighting for uh, equitable public services. Uh, institutional determinants of successful public community partnerships. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my author, Leo Heller, Professor Leo Heller at the Federal University of Western Eyes uh, in uh, Brazil. Uh, as for me, I'm a member of PSIRU, the Public Services International Research Unit at the University of Greenwich in the UK. Uh, we have done empirical work on public-public partnerships as an alternative uh, way to develop uh, public services in the water sector, but not only the water sector. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, address in particular the uh, one member of the family of public-public partnerships, uh, public community partnerships, and the institutional determinants of successful public community partnerships. Uh, most of our material is, the empirical material in particular, is available on our website www.psiu.org and there you will find uh, PSIU reports and other uh, reports on public public partnerships, including those that we have had the good fortune of co authoring with. Uh, National Institute and the Competition Order in particular. Um, as regards the research questions that I would like to address, first, what are public community partnerships? And in order to uh, address this question, I will talk about the relationship between public community partnerships and public public partnerships. Uh, I will also talk about the relationship between public community partnerships and governance and sustainable water development as the aim of uh, delivering of providing the service. I will also uh, try to address another question which is well more well, it's quite explicitly uh, put down in the title which is, which is what are the institutional determinants of successful public uh, well, okay, public community partnerships, it should be, but we can extend that to public public partnerships. Uh, so, what, how institutions can uh, be conducive to a successful uh, configuration of public public partnerships or public community partnerships. In particular, we'll be talking about the role of the state and the role of community within partnerships. So at micro level, this is what I call the micro level. So when you have a partnership, what is the relationship and role, respective role of the state and community? But also I'll be looking at the role of the state and community outside partnerships. Because this is something that we do not uh, uh, think about enough, I would say, when we talk about partnerships, when we talk about delivery of the services. So, uh, what other role can be played by the state, by communities, outside of the specific partnerships or the specific uh, project? Uh, first of all, trying to define a bit public community partnerships. Uh, I would like to start from the broader family of public public partnerships, uh, which are. First of all, they are not-for-profit partnerships, partnerships that are not-for-profit. Now, there are many partnerships that are not-for-profit. They are not necessarily progressive. Uh, and uh, Satoko will be uh, talking more about the, uh, um, the, the, the broader set of not-for-profit partnerships. I'm not talking about public-public partnerships. Uh, Thinking of them as progressive partnerships, peer relationships aimed at developing capacity to be effective and accountable public services, which exclude profit seeking, because once you introduce profit, profit maximization imperative, as we heard today from Tom, uh, this imperative skews all the considerations and uh, crowds out 
or the possibility of addressing community development, profit maximization, market development uh, do not go well together with community development. So, if you uh, if you want to promote community development in a progressive way, of course, you have to exclude uh, profit seeking. And so, profit peer relationships aimed at developing capacity. Um, and I would like to say something about capacity because this is uh, how public public partnerships, public community partnerships link to governance and to sustainable water development. Now, water services, we think, that uh, are delivered for one aim, which is sustainable water development. Others might have other ways to define those uh, overarching aims. Uh, however, uh, governance is, or good governance, it's a, 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 a problematic term, but I will use it anyway. It's one way of getting to sustainable water development. And capacity is really the software of getting there. Uh, it's very, very difficult to advance in the delivery of a service, whatever your objectives are, whether you want to extend service coverage to the poor, whether you want to improve the impact on the environment, whatever the priority locally, it's very difficult to do that without, local, without capacity, without knowledge and the ability to, uh, to, to take action, whether at human individual level or at organizational or institutional level. So capacity is the software uh, that makes happen development. Uh, and public-public partnerships are defined by publicness. This is something that it's a, an attempt to uh, go uh, beyond definitions of public-public partnerships in terms of ownership, thinking of partnerships between the public sector and community. Uh, I think that uh, it's more helpful if we uh, try to define public-public partnerships in terms of publicness. And so instead of putting the emphasis on the, on the ownership, we put the emphasis on the public ethos, on the participants in a partnership. That's when the ethos is shared, the same ethos, a pro-public, pro-community ethos is shared, then it's much easier to have a collaboration between different organizations which is conducive to promoting community development. Uh, and in fact, and well, you know, the reason for doing that is that you, can, you might very well have public operators that behave uh, under a neoliberal uh, agenda. And again, today I'm uh, sure, uh, not only in the first uh, session of the morning, but you might have uh, encountered this issue. So in order to, 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 to make sure that we're talking about progressive public-public partnerships, uh, it's helpful to define them by publicness in terms of public ethos. The condivision, the, the joint uh, recognition of this public sector ethos. Uh, so they include public operators, public agencies, but also labor and communities. So that's why public-public partnerships include also public community partnerships. And in that case, in both cases, knowledge is considered as a public good. It's not considered as a private good, which is labeled by some intellectual property rights. And again, that is a neoliberal instrument to, uh, uh, to put a barrier to access to governance of the commons. So that's important to consider knowledge as public good, something that you can share freely, freely, without uh, fear. And, uh, and also collaboration and trust become you know, the key drivers of PAPS, thanks to knowledge being recognized as public good. Conceptual framework, uh, I will not name names, I think it's uh, easier that way, but Public community partnerships have already been conceptualized around the notion of co-production of services, uh, even if we have some limitations. Well, actually, okay, I'll name names. Eleanor Rostrom, she started talking about the co-production of services, even if she was doing that with some limitations. 
uh, her idea of the rule of the state was not uh, terribly well encouraged, uh, the, the rule of the state. Uh, and uh, also, when you look at social capital, which is quite fundamental in the uh, idea of co production of services, yeah. you have the, uh, the triad of networks, trust, and norms. But it's quite difficult to understand how these three interact together in order to make any, well, any, any result that you can identify or be desirable. Uh, so I, I, uh, I have worked on uh, other frameworks, uh, also starting from the, from the work of Oliver, Oliver Williamson, because what he does is to start saying, how does the qualities, the attributes of different types of organization uh, of producing living services uh, lead to the uh, end result, to the uh, final aim of the specific service. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I offer this framework of actors' attitudes. So what are their attitudes? What are their interests which inform their attitudes? Uh, and interests together with their values and together with uh, and uh, shared and trenched ideas. What is their power? Apart from what they want to achieve, do they have the means to achieve it? Because that makes a difference. And then also, what is the institutional matrix? So, what are the institutions, the rules, the norms, the customs? Are they facilitating this interaction between actors so that they can effectively achieve the objectives that they community identify? or not. I have four case studies uh, of public community partnerships, all in Latin America, uh, one in Costa Rica, one in Brazil, one in Uruguay, and one in Venezuela. The one in Uruguay, I am uh, very grateful to Susan Sprott and colleagues who have uh, done a wonderful um, uh, chapter case study in uh, one of the MSP books, which is coming. Uh, I'm sure it will be launched and it will be discussed. Uh, I also am grateful to my co-author for the work on Brazil um, and the and work on Venezuela. Uh, I, I would just like to say very briefly that all these are cases of public community partnerships that are successful in the area of water. Uh, they are not all the same. There are different combinations, for example, in uh, Costa Rica, Uruguay, and Venezuela, it is more the state that is interacting together with communities. Uh, they're all successful in their own way. They've all achieved uh, good results, very good results in some cases. In the case of Venezuela, those public community partnerships how Venezuela achieved the Millennium Development Goals, whatever you think of the progressiveness of the Millennium Development Goals, but they helped Venezuela to achieve the Millennium Development Goals on water, uh, I think it was 2004 or something like that, or 2006, but anyway, years, many years before the rest of the uh, international community indeed, and the uh, Millennium Development Goal for on citation was only two years later. So um, all these cases, they, they are problems of the state, with the exception of Brazil, where there is a municipality, municipal government interacting with the uh, community. Uh, but all of them, uh, well, they, they have different issues, uh, they are in terms of the uh, goals, they are different issues in terms of organizing the collaboration, the partnership, but all of them managed to be successful because uh, in, in all cases, uh, the actors, the public sector actors and the community actors were sharing the same interests. They were together to achieve the same goal, uh, which is something very, very difficult, if not impossible, with public-private partnerships because of the profit maximization imperative, which is obviously making sure that the private sector gets the lion's share and the others are left with well, a few nice words. Um, 
And I would like to emphasize in particular uh, a couple of cases, like for example Uruguay and Venezuela, where there was in particular an emphasis on educating citizens and trying to see trying to see partnerships as an instrument to not only deliver the service in a narrowly technocratic way, but also to develop community by developing citizenship. And so trying to see those partnerships as an opportunity for involving the community, involving the citizenship, involving the citizen in an exercise of their own rights and their own obligations. Because that was seen as quite a key fundamental step in uh, developing a sense of citizenship and also community. So discussion of findings. First of all, uh, Successful public, public community partnerships are enabled by A, the commonality of partners' objectives, as we discussed, so this ability of sharing the same ethos so that uh, the partners, public and community are working together uh, for the same objective and the same aim. Secondly, the complementarity of partners' resources. Now, there are limitations both in uh, for the state and both for community, but usually what uh, happens is that communities have the local knowledge, they do not necessarily have the uh, institutionalized or technical knowledge. And this is something that uh, utilities, public utilities, can help uh, address. Also with uh, public funding. Uh, perhaps you might discuss this more in detail during the discussion, but um, uh, so the majority of partners' resources was quite important. And also the institutional side of the partnership, prioritizing the effectiveness over the efficiency, instead of just fetishizing neoliberal documents like efficiency, but yes, efficiency for what? So effectiveness, achieving the developmental goals that have been community defined. And, and it was, was quite crucial in making sure that the institutional side was helping the partnerships be effective. Uh, I think this is the last slide. I would like to uh, no, actually get in there. Uh, again, discussion of findings number two. Public community partnerships can contribute to sustainable water development exactly due to this alignment when this alignment is realized in terms of the commonality of the interests, of the complementarity of the resources, and the institutional design that is, uh, well, aligned with the goals of community development, not against, pitched against it. The literature on public community partnerships remains limited, so uh, yeah, it would be nice to see more of this, uh, more, more work on this, uh, and I look forward to that. Uh, the state plays a significant role in the success of public community partnerships. Yeah, this is quite important, I think, not only as owner, operator, and financier, but also as policy maker. Uh, there were a couple of cases where the success of the partnerships were very much due to the fact that the state was not just uh, played by the neoliberal agenda, but it was trying to think uh, creatively, autonomously, outside the box if you want, but what are the policies that are helping community development, whether it is you know, rural scale, peri-urban or, or not. And they were going and doing it. Uh, and uh, that's very important to see that, you know, uh, there is also this role of policy maker. What happens under the liberal uh, dogma is that we are always reminded that you know the, the role of the state should be confined to policy making. Uh, well, you know, I, I believe that is, the role of the state should happen at all levels: policy making, but also financing and operations. And conclusions: Development is the result of uh, policy interventions at micro level, for example, the specific partnership, but also macro level. So, designing and providing the policies that are conducive to the success of public community partnerships. 
Now, scholarship and policy, so the academics and policy uh, participants as well, in the last decades have focused perhaps too much on micro level interventions. And this is a reaction of the neoliberal agenda, or just doing in gang of, or you know, the micro efficiencies that the private sector is going to deliver by magic, of course. Uh, and my, uh, yeah, my, my, my final conclusion, my final point is that I believe that greater attention should be given to the interplay between the micro and the macro level interventions because uh, I very much doubt that you can achieve success at micro level public community partnerships if the right policies, policies that are aligned with community development not with market development. So if the right policy is aligned and conducive to community development are not there. So it's very important to think about uh, how those two levels, the micro and the macro, interact so that you can achieve the uh, final goal of uh, promoting sustainable water development. Uh, thanks.